journalism in general or writing in general or novels or anything at all. Don't ask me about hockey because I don't know anything about hockey, but we can talk about the Blue Jays if you want. Um, let's talk about writing for a few minutes. So Farley Mullet, who I think spoke here once, uh, the late Farley, the late great Farley Mullet, once said that the only pleasure in writing lies in its cessation. And he wrote more than 40 books, so I think maybe he was just a little bit full of it. Uh, and when Dorothy Parker, the great humorist, uh, novelist, short story writer, journalist, was asked if she liked writing, she scoffed, probably had a little sip of her martini too, and she said, I like having written, which is pretty much what I think any writer will tell you. The act itself of writing can be very painful and laborious and sometimes wonderful, sometimes filled with these joyful um, and uplifting moments. But it is also work, and it sometimes feels quite painful while we're doing it. Um, and so why do we do it? Why do we write? Why do we write books? Why do we write newspaper articles? Why are some of us journalists? Well, I'll start with journalism. Um, and I would say that the reason that we become journalists, or that those of us who are journalists love it, uh, is, uh, I'll paraphrase Winston Churchill when he talked about democracy. And he said that um, democracy is the worst form of government, except for all the other forms of government. And journalism is a bit like that. It's the worst job in the world, except for all the other jobs. So it is actually, I think, in many ways, the best job in the world. Uh, and here you'll say, but oh, wait, didn't I see Donald Trump saying CNN sucks on TV? And various people complaining about the lamestream media. Yeah, it is going through a um, convulsion right now. Uh, journalism is in the Western world. Um, but that does not mean that it's going to be um, short-lived, that it's going to go away anytime soon. Uh, I think it's as vibrant as ever, except that it will change form, is what my feeling is. I work for a newspaper, it probably seems um, quaint to any of you. Do any of you actually get your news from a news paper? A paper. Oh, okay. Does anybody under the age of 40 get their news <laughs> from the newspaper? Okay, a few of you. Okay, interesting. I had to show my daughter, who's 10, the other day, how to actually fold a newspaper. And she was sort of sitting there with it like this. It was like a crazy Marx Brother moment where it was going everywhere. And I had to show her how to snap it open and fold it into, into quarters. But even if you don't kill trees 10 years down the road, 15 years down the road, in order for you to get your news, even if it doesn't arrive at your door that way, I don't think journalism is going anywhere. Uh, it just might not arrive in that particular form. So what form will it arise in? Well, we're seeing some of it now. We're seeing a variety of different ways of telling stories and of presenting information in interesting ways, in ways that are useful to you, who get your news often, on your phone and for whom uh, social media is as natural as breathing. You know? um, I know the phrase digital natives maybe drives people a bit crazy, but uh, that is the generation you live in. I, I still remember actually typing out my essays on a full selectric typewriter, which none of you, thank God, will ever have to do. So now you see Vice. BuzzFeed, uh, Vox, some of these other um, podcasts. So other ways of delivering what is essentially still the same thing, which is news, which is stories, which is information that you can use and that you want to share with people. Um, the Globe, the newspaper I work for, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times are all uh, finding ways to monetize themselves through what's called a paywall, which means essentially that you get a few free articles. Well, in the case of the Wall Street Journal, you get none. Um, that's Rupert Murdoch for you. Uh, 
and then you, once you hit the limit of your articles, you pay for the rest. So we have to find a way, obviously, to pay for the services that we journalists uh, deliver. Um, Toronto Star, you may have heard as a new and unique way of uh, raising capital, which is that they're starting to sell coffee. They will sell, they will, they will bring ground bags of coffee to your house with the Toronto Star in the morning. It's called Headline Coffee. It's kind of a stupid name, but there you go. If they start rivaling Starbucks, I think the rest of us will absolutely be following right after them. So why won't journalism die? Well, I think it is because people need information and stories. I think information and stories are the currency of our human marketplace. Um, and although we're in a pickle as far as getting people to pay for things, it's true, um, we have not, and we've seen a shrinkage in the size of newsrooms across North America over the past 20 years by a like probably 40% or more. We've seen newspapers closed down. You're still lucky to have your own local newspaper. We've seen lots of newspapers closed down, especially local ones, which is going to be a huge problem, I think, actually, for democracy. Uh, in fact, we have a, a Canadian government has struck a committee going across the country to listen to people talking about what the death of local news and the future of the news media will mean for the country and for democracy. Because if you're living in a little town, um, let's say you're in Belleville, and you would have had a paper that was 150 years old, and for 150 years had been covered local politics, and had been sending a reporter, probably a very young reporter, who hoped one day to go work for the CPC or something. But a young reporter would have gone to the council meetings every single day, and it's boring, but things would have risen there. You know, corruption, uh, the, the quality of the water, zoning bylaws, uh, uh, you know, political deal making that shouldn't have been going on. So when this kind of thing dies, nobody covers it because it's not as exciting, unfortunately, as you know, Kim Kardashian or some of the other, uh, or Ken Bone or some of the other things that we um, become obsessed with very quickly and are fleeting. There's still a lot of superb journalism being made. If you are all watching the American election, anybody watching, keeping an eye on the American election? Okay, some of you might have heard stories about um, Donald Trump and his um, particularly strange relationship with women. Uh, some of you may have heard about his strange relationship to his taxes, his non relationship to taxes. Those are stories that were broken by newspapers, by the Washington Post, by the uh, New York Times, by the Wall Street Journal, by the Guardian in um, Britain, uh, and BuzzFeed. BuzzFeed's been doing amazing work. In fact, CNN hired uh, uh, the political editor of BuzzFeed and his whole team to go work for them because they were doing such amazing work. This is how the old media and the new, CNN's not even that old, but how they come together and grow for the future, I think. Um, so my biography, to, I'll just quickly tell you, I was born and raised in Toronto. Uh, as I said, my father had, although we got the Toronto Star every day, I don't think he thought terribly highly of um, journalists. Uh, I went to Ryerson, then a Polytechnic Institute. So my degree is not actually a BA, but a B-A-A-J, Bodge, <laughs> Bachelor of Applied Arts in Journalism. I uh, immediately on leaving university, uh, got a full-time job, uh, no, which is unheard of these days, at the Globe and Mail, and started as a coffee editor. Um, and, you know, it really was wonderful to be able to have that kind of freedom and liberty. They let you do pretty much whatever you wanted. Uh, this is unfortunately after the days of, you know, cigarettes had gone the way of Nobody was smoking in the newsroom, nobody was drinking in the newsroom, but it was still a huge amount of fun. And you will, um, I'm embarrassed to tell you all this, but you can feel free to laugh. One of the first things I did at the Globe, uh, I, when I was 27, they asked me to write a column. The first column actually appeared on my 27th birthday, and the column was called Under 30. Yes, I was supposed to explain <laughs> what was then uh, Generation X. I'm, I'm 
Generation X. Um, we were the millennials of our day, let me tell you, it was a long time ago, but we went through many of the same things. And I was supposed to explain young people to the aging readers of the Globe and Mail. We're still doing the exact same thing today. It was very embarrassing. Um, and I wrote about <laughs> very stupid things. But also some very interesting things in feminism, pot legalization, the exact same things I'm writing about today. Also, why Red and Stimpy was the best show ever, which I... <laughs> Thank you, Red and Stimpy fans. <laughs> Excellent. Good to hear. Uh, I was the books editor of the Globe and Mail. I was a publishing reporter. I was a feature writer. Um, in, I left briefly to go to a magazine called Elm Street. I ran a magazine called Elm Street, which is uh, late and not very lamented by many people. Um, and then I went back to the Globe and Mail, and I, uh, my husband and I were reporters for the Globe in Los Angeles for three years. I came back, I was the arts editor of the Globe, and then I, we moved to London, and we were uh, reporters in the London Bureau. So he covered all of Europe, I covered the UK for eight years, which was extraordinary. And what was extraordinary about it, this is what makes journalism the best job ever, and um, if you want in the Q&As, we can talk a little bit about you know, whether that is still the case and whether any of you want to go into it. Uh, it introduces you to people and brings you to places you would never, ever get to go otherwise. I had a really wealthy friend, not really wealthy, he was pretty wealthy in London, who certainly was worth like 20 times more than I will ever be worth. And uh, I told him I was doing some story or I was going to ask God or something to cover the race. And he said, well, I don't understand why you get to go everywhere and do all these things. And you know, things he did not have access to. And I said, well, that's what journalism does for you. It doesn't pay very well, but it means you get to do something very cool every single day. So I met uh, some of the most extraordinary people. Every day brought something new. And the other thing is, if you're at all curious, and if you're not curious, you shouldn't be a journalist. It, it's a job where you get paid for being nosy. I cannot think of another job in the world where you get paid if you're a nosy person, if you like gossiping, if you like knowing about other people's business. It is the best job in the world because they pay you to do this. They pay. Sometimes I would find myself at a dinner party and I would be talking to somebody and I realized, look, I would have asked them 30 questions. And they would say things like, you know, you're giving me the third degree here. Like, that's too many questions. And I'd say, oh, okay, sorry. I have to like, turn off my work brain and stop grilling them about whatever was happening. So every day I would go out, let's say when we were in London, and meet the most extraordinary people. I'll just tell you quickly about some of them. Um, I accompanied a bunch of Canadian war veterans of the Second World War to the Netherlands in um, 2010, the 65th anniversary of the, is that right? Yeah, for, of the uh, liberation of Holland. So these soldiers had been there, they'd all been very young men. They, the Dutch had greeted them as conquering heroes when they come, uh, and I got to go back with them. And it was really amazing to see, because they were in you know, their mid-80s, and a lot of them were very, very emotional when we got there, and they told me stories about the friends they lost. And then we got to meet all these young uh, high school students. Because in Holland, what they do is the high school students look after the international war graves. And each high school is put in charge of a war grave. So there'll be allied soldiers who died in the Netherlands during the uh, liberation. And the graves are stunningly beautiful. They're kept so lovingly. And all Dutch high school students learn about this. And being there with the veterans was just fantastic. I mean, you know, one hand there are these kind of salty old guys who've known each other for 65 years, and another they were, you know, weeping openly about things that happened 65 years before. I also met in the bunker where Churchill and his war cabinet uh, gathered in the Second World War. I met a woman who'd been Churchill's secretary, uh, and another woman who'd been um, Bomber Harris's uh, secretary and got to talk to them about what it was like to be in the bunker, you know, underneath Westminster in London as the bombs were falling during the Blitz. And uh, the interesting thing about that is they both said that 
They were the best years of their lives. I said, you must have been terrified. They said, I'm not going to do the English accent. I said, no, it was fantastic. It was the best years of my lives. So exciting. All the young men in uniform. They just loved it. <laughs> I got to accompany a Canadian arborist who worked in Britain, uh, cataloging all the ancient trees of Britain. I followed him around for a day. It was like being with Gandalf. It was quite amazing. <laughs> Um, I, did, I interviewed a woman who studied the decline in public washrooms. Why are there not enough public washrooms anymore? To me, this is a fascinating question. And she was an academic who was studying this. Uh, and she also gave me one of my favorite uh, phrases of all time, which is the bladder's leash, which is how far you can go when you leave your house before you go have to pee. The bladder's leash. Feel free to use it. Uh, I interviewed you know, racehorse trainers and opera singers and bus drivers. Uh, but mainly, I got to talk to just normal people. And the gift every day of having people trust you with their stories. And when you, sometimes I would like, sit back and think about it. I think, like, I just went up to that stranger and asked them to talk to me and tell me some deep secret that I would then publish for the world. And they would do it. I mean, it's, it's really a wonderful sacred gift and a trust that you get from people and like it's it, it's your job they get, you get paid to do it not very much I'll keep coming back to this but not very much you get paid but <laughs> the job itself is um, quite wonderful uh, but then at some point um, journalism becomes you know it's enough for many people but for some people it's not and you want to go beyond the truth and start making things up. And I know you're thinking, like, don't journalists just make things up anyway? Well, no, we try not to. But if you want to actually make things up and find the truth behind the truth or reveal your own truth, um, you can become a novelist. So lots of journalists have become novelists. Uh, Charles Dickens wrote uh, parliamentary sketches before he became a successful novelist. and. Uh, Ernest Hemingway, of course, worked for the Toronto Star and um, other newspapers and magazines. And more recently, I don't know if any of you have read uh, Girl on the Train. Can you read Girl on the Train? Yeah? Okay. Hugely best-selling book. And um, she was a financial journalist, uh, Paula Hawkins. Linwood Barclay, uh, also hugely best-selling thriller writer now, and used to work for the Toronto Star. So. Uh, I think a lot of people feel, you know, the straitjacket of, of writing down other people's words verbatim every day, or pretty much verbatim, and just putting them out there. And you feel like, I, you know what, I, I have another story in me that I can tell. Because sometimes you would go to a press conference or something, it would be a very quick story. I, uh, in London, had to go interview um, Gordon Brown, who was the Prime Minister. And whenever there was a G8 or G20 summit, he would call in um, a certain number of journalists to 10 Downing Street, and he would, he would tell you some boring stories about tariffs or something. So I was one of them, and we went with a few other journalists, and he was giving us some, I'm sure, very worthwhile facts and figures about the British trade deficit or something. And I looked and I noticed that his fingernails were like chewed well below the quick. He had obviously been gnawing on his nails forever, probably. And I thought, that's so fascinating. The British Prime Minister I can't stop chewing his fingernails. And that's the thing I wanted to write about the next day. But, you know, you can't write that in the Golden Mail. You can't write. <laughs> British Prime Minister has some anxiety problem that I don't really understand. I wonder what it is. <laughs> but if you write a novel, you can do that. So this leads me to why I thought uh, that I would write a novel myself. Now you have to understand, um, I was one of those kids who was obsessed with reading. I was, drove people around me crazy. I would read and walk into lamppost. I would read in the car. I'd read at the you know, dinner table and I would drive my parents crazy. Uh, and then I, then I had this life in books at the newspaper. I was the books editor, the publishing reporter. I interviewed writers constantly. And writing seemed to me a thing like, like brain surgery or being an astronaut. Like, that's not something I could do. I could never write a novel. It's, it's alchemy. It's some crazy thing. You have to be 
like just a genius to do. And then one day, I don't even know what made me think I would try it, but I'm going to try it. What's the worst that can happen? What's the worst that can happen? I waste a lot of hours of my life, but I probably would have just spent them watching old episodes of General Hospital on YouTube. Anyway, so why not try to write a novel instead? So I did. Um, and the seed for this novel, um, which is called Based on a True Story, it's a novel about uh, an alcoholic and drug addicted British actress who's sort of down on her luck. She's in midlife and she uh, has become unemployable because she's um, made a spectacle of herself on so many uh, movie and television sets. And she has had a surprise a little bit of late in life uh, success with her memoir, which is called Based on a True Story. It's all very meta. But um, her memoir is filled with lies, which she realizes and she hopes that nobody else knows. And she becomes um, uh, fixated on this idea that this man from her past is going to write another book setting a record strip and telling the truth about their life together, which she doesn't want anyone to know. So she enlists the help of this kind of um, uh, also at loose ends, young American journalist who's living in London and who is having a bit of success but not very much and who, uh, well I won't tell you what happens because I'm going to read that chapter, but the two of them end up together on a road trip to um, the United States. So and where mayhem ensues. It's a bit like um, Lucy and Ethel, for those of you who remember, uh, uh, except with a lot more drinking. Um, I like to say also that it's like Thelma and Louise with less death and more booze. Um, and nobody drives off a cliff at the end, which is good. I'm very happy about So, um, the many things made me want to write about. I've always been fascinated with like celebrity memoirs and not just celebrity memoirs but memoirs of famous people who you know whether they're writers or politicians or whatever because it always seemed to me they never could uh, as much as you think you know yourself and as much as you're trying to be honest with yourself and as much as you go out and say this is my raw honest heart on the page here it's my belief that nobody ever really can know themselves entirely and nor can you really entirely spill yourself on the pages of a memoir or an autobiography. You can try to, and I think you can get close. There's always going to be the space between the mask and the face that we don't get to see. And I thought about this for a long time. And then in 1996, I went and interviewed uh, a woman, some of you might know, some of you who are a little bit older will know, named Marianne Faithful. So Mary Ann Faithful is this fantastic figure from the 1960s London. She is most famous, unfortunately, even to this day for being Mick Jagger's girlfriend for a long time, but she's a fantastic singer in her own right, an interpreter of um, cabaret songs and writer and actress. Anyway, she had written this memoir in 1996 called Faithful, and I went to, oh, sorry, the other thing she's mostly famous for is being a huge drug addict and alcoholic. That's the thing she's actually probably most famous for. And she was homeless for a year in London uh, because she was on heroin the whole time. Anyway, I went to interview her and she's just this sort of over the top, wonderful figure, very dramatic. And um, uh, she had written this book called Faithful, this memoir. And I expected to get the same story from her. You get every, from everybody who writes a memoir, which is, oh yeah, this is my heart and soul on the page. And instead she said, as it's the Mickey Keith story. That's what the publisher wants. It has nothing to do with me. Nothing at all, darling. And I thought, oh, that was fascinating that she had admitted that this book, which actually is a really good book, if you get a chance to read it, was just something she'd written for money and didn't really have anything to do with her life at all. And the other great thing that happened was she was quite drunk when I interviewed her. And she um, <laughs> she'd just come back from lunch and she had this terrible raging toothache and the um, publicist, who's now my publisher actually, the publicist was on the phone in this giant 
um, majestic hotel suite uh, with a dentist trying to get her some antibiotics to rage his toothache and to help the toothache. And she, the publicist called across the room to Marianne Fable. Marianne, the dentist wants to know if there's any drugs you're allergic to. And Marianne Faithful said, oh, no, darling, there's no drug I'm allergic to. And at this point, I would know, <laughs> which I just lost. So I left it there, and I was like totally in love with Marianne Faithful. And the seed for this got planted in my head about the lies we tell ourselves and the lies we tell other people and how those things can never, and maybe never should actually, you know, be fitted together. Maybe like complete honesty is a, a, a myth or an unattainable goal. Anyway, I'm going to read you a little bit uh, from, based on a true story, just a very, 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 very short bit, which is the first chapter, because I want to just talk about a few other things before we get to the questions. <clears throat> so it begins with Augusta being kicked out of rehab, uh, not for the first time. Augusta, sorry, is the name of the main character, the um, the actress who's down on her luck. <clears throat> it was not the first time she'd been asked to leave a clinic. Augusta huddled into her coat as the wind as the wind cut across the porch. The nurse who'd come to say goodbye remained inside, as if afraid to leave the safety of the foyer. One hand held out in farewell, and the other on the handle of the door. The paint was peeling down the side, Augusta noticed. The other clinics had been much smarter than this. She took the outstretched hands, their cold fingers meeting. This nurse, Jennifer, had been her sole friend and ally over one long week, which should have been two. We'll not see you here again, Jennifer said. No, said Augusta. You'll not see me here again. Well, said the nurse, you know you can always ring me any time if you do feel yourself slipping. My mobile's on there. And she fished a card from the pocket of her blue tunic. Augusta looked at it and realized, with some surprise, that the nurse she'd been calling Jennifer was in fact named Claudia. The door itched shut, and Claudia turned back inside to tend the drunks and wastrels who knew how to obey rules. Augusta watched her go. She really should have made more of an effort to hide the pills, but who knew that her roommate would be such a quizzling? She walked to the curb, where a minicab sat idling. Someone had drawn a penis in the dirt on its side, elephantine testicles dangling below. My chariot, she said. A copy of the local newspaper tumbled along the pavement and wrapped itself around her ankle. Walthamstow Shopping Center to celebrate 25 years, read the headline on the front page. Walthamstow, foil on the neck of London, where she'd begun, and against all her best efforts, where she had washed up. She kicked the newspaper aside and reached for the door of the minicab. Alma Partridge sat in the back wrapped in an ancient fur as stiff as a sarcophagus. Augusta slid in beside her, inhaling the mingled smells of her old friend's musty coat and the driver's luncheon kebab. Alma gave him an address in Camden, and he pulled out into the traffic. After a moment, Alma placed a dry and papery hand over Augusta's. You look well, my dear. How's the sanatorium? Augusta closed her eyes against the pain of the last afternoon light. It was fine. Fewer meetings than usual, thank Christ. But if you really want to know, a bit on the cheap side. Thin gruel. She felt Alma's hand withdraw. Perhaps if you'd stayed the course, it would have proved more useful. And despite herself, Augusta laughed. You have a positively maternal gift for the bar of Alma. How I missed that when I was inside. All they spoke about was vulnerability and forgiveness and reaching out and recovering one's footing. Not such bad things, Alma said. And journey as a verb, Alma shuddered. That is disgraceful. With an effort, Augusta wrenched one eye open. I'm grateful you came to collect me, darling. Really, you're my dearest friend. I'm your only. Augusta brought her hand up. The broken tip of one fingernail dangled like an unlatched gate. I am well aware it does not bear repeating. Each retreated to her own corner in rankled silence. No photographers outside when I left, Augusta muttered. I thought the rags loved this kind of filth, fallen celebrities. Alma raised one pencil brow with the word celebrities. She said, I believe what they're searching for is the unexpected fall. 
She ran a hand through her nimbus of white hair, coaxing the sparse strands higher. As the car sped south, the lights of shops and restaurants glowed in the gathering dusk. It seemed that every second window advertised a pub quiz, pictures of draft on sale, discounted trays of shooters. So, Augusta said brightly, drink? She felt Alma stiffen next to her and reached out to clasp her friend's hand. A joke, Dorothy. Merely a joke. That's the first short chapter of this. It's hopefully not my, next, my last novel, but we'll see. Um, so, writing. Um, one of the great reasons, too, that even if your parents think that being a writer is burning money, is that when you do write your book, you get to show them it. There it is. See, it's actually here. I did it. You take them into a bookstore. You're like, look, there it is. Um, so, I thought I would share with so some of you want to be writers. I would share with you some of the uh, wisdom that, because I have quite seriously interviewed probably more than 200 writers over the uh, course of 25 years. Yes, 25 years. I know, you can't believe it, can I? Really? How could I have been working for 25 years? Uh, and the funny thing is when you interview novelists, they, uh, the same things keep being said over and over again. Um, and you can buy big, thick books that will condense some of this wisdom for you, and some of them are actually good. Um, but the main things seem to be read a lot and read widely. Um, if you don't love reading, you're not going to love writing and you're not going to have the patience for it. And, and widely because, um, because style changes over time. So if you read things from 50 years ago, from 80 years ago, from 200 years ago, it will sound different to your ear and it will give you a wider sense of what the possibilities are of the language um, for your own language and for your own usage and what you can do. And it's amazing when you go back and read like books that were popular, you know, let's say 50 years ago, John O'Hare or something that have fallen off the, the curriculum, nobody really looks at them anymore. And you see why they were popular then, and they're so stylish, or James M. King, something like that, they're so stylistically uh, interesting. So it's, it's good to not just read, I think, stuff that's come out in the past you know, five or ten years. Um, one of my favorite writers of all time is Hilary Mantel, the novelist, most famous for her, her Booker Prize winning novels about Thomas Cromwell, Bring Up the Bodies, and Wolf Hall. Um, she's writing a third one. Anyway, she said, write the book that you want to read. And like, I know it sounds so trite, write the book you want to read, but really it, it's such a, a crucial piece of advice in that you can't, you might think that you should be writing like the great Canadian literary novel about the death of some mill town or something, but really what you want to write is about dragons, or you want to write a mystery, or you want to write a romance then that's what you should be writing, you know? And you should not feel that there's this other thing over here that's more important or better for you or anything. You will, as soon as you try to write something that feels false, you'll, you'll see, you'll feel how wrong it is for you. And, 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 and the, the flip side of that is when you find something that is right for you, you'll feel it. And you'll feel that, I'm not saying it won't be hard work, because it will, but you'll feel, it, it feels more like, you know, going downhill uh, on a nice toboggan and not trying to drag your toboggan uphill. Uh, bum and chair, that is the thing that every single writer will tell you. <laughs> there's just no other way, there's nothing around it. You have to put your bum in the chair every day, even if it's for an hour, you know, but every day you take weekends off of your birthday. But pretty, it, it has to be a job. It's not a hobby, it's a job if you want to be successful at it. Um, Elizabeth Gilbert said, you know, the, the writer of Eat, Pray, Love said something that I thought was really great recently uh, in her book about creativity, which I urge you to read. Um, she said, recognize that fear is going to come along with you. And you could say to fear, you can be in the car, but you don't get to drive. You don't get to be in the driver's seat. I know you're going to be, like, in my head the whole time telling me, oh, I can't do it, or nobody's going to read this, or it's useless, and that's fine. You, you won't, that voice will never leave. But you just have to say, 
acknowledge it and say, you're there, but you're not going to stop me from doing this thing that I'm doing. And I think that's a really powerful piece of advice because our internal messaging system is often the thing that crushes us. It's usually not somebody outside saying, don't write that book. People outside don't care if you write the book or not if you spend two hours a night doing that instead of something else. It's the voice inside you that says you can't do this or nobody cares. So ignore the voice. Put it in a little, make it sit in the back seat. Um, Stephen King wrote a really, really, I have a lot of time for Stephen King. I love Stephen King. And he wrote a great book called On Writing, which is actually my probably my favorite book about writing. Uh, and he said, uh, it was the first draft with the door closed, second draft with the door open. What that means is your first draft is going to be somebody else, uh, Anne Lamont, I think, put it more concisely, a bit more vulgarly when she said something like, the first draft is always shit. And it is. So what Stephen King and Anne Lamont were saying was, just write, just get it on the page, just put it there, and where the real writing occurs, and where the work occurs, and where the joy occurs, is when you rewrite. And when Stephen King says, write the second draft of the door open, it means at some point in your rewriting of your book, you will, or your story, you will want to give it to somebody else. Probably not the first draft or two, but at some point you will. You'll give it to somebody you trust, uh, if it's a teacher, a friend, a relative, whoever, and say to them, give me an honest opinion. And then it's up to you whether you take on board those criticisms and suggestions or not. It's totally up to you. Um, but that is, oh, and the other thing is um, to learn to love rejection. There's not a writer in the world who has not had uh, a ton of rejection. Every, probably, I would say, like every famous novel you can name has been rejected by the Lolita was, you know, one publisher wrote to Nabokov and said, you know, you like, you, if you publish this, you will be the most, you know, it's too depraved even to imagine. I, I would be sent to jail if we published this. J.K. Rowling, I don't even know how many people she sent the first Harry Potter book to and turned down and turned down and turned down. Uh, rejection is part of your life. Uh, it is the rarest, rarest unicorn of a book that gets accepted or is, you know, you read about bidding wars over first novel. They happen, but they're rarer than unicorns. Um, and the other thing is, uh, a couple things nobody will tell you. Uh, it's going to take much longer than you expect. Much, 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 much longer. There'll be a lot of drafts involved. There's very little money <laughs> in it, unfortunately. So you have to do it for love. Um, because it interests you. Because you think it's important. Even if the only people who read it are you and your friend. Or you put it online and hope somebody reads it. That's got to be enough for you. Um, because the giant pots at the end of the rainbow, the Gone Girls and the J.K. Rowling, they, they happen, obviously, but they're rare. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, but if you love it, and if you love the writing, it's really all you need. Um, so the great thing about being a writer is you need no real, you don't need a degree. Um, some people argue you might be an MFA. I don't necessarily think you do. You don't need any tools except for a computer or even a pen and a paper. Lots of people still write longhand. You would be surprised at the number of novels you write longhand. I think partly because it makes you think more about the words as you put them down. Um, so you need very few tools. You need no, no real expertise whatsoever. You don't even need a room of one's own. Despite what Virginia Woolf said, you can do it at Starbucks. You can sit by the window all day long with one latte and do it. All you really need is love of words and of people, and you need to be curious, and you need to have a story that you want to tell. And then you'll be ready. And that is all. I think that leaves us just enough time for questions. I hope some of you have questions about journalism or writing or anything at all. Yes? Do you have to be a creative person to be a good journalist, is the question. Um, no. I would say no, you don't. 
because I think the qualities for being a good journalist are you need to be able to use a telephone, which is not that hard. <laughs> you, can, you can dial a number, you're, you're kind of a journalist. My husband, who's also a journalist, always says, he drives me crazy when people ask if journalism is a profession. He's like, no, it's barely a craft. Really, all you need to do is be able to put, talk to somebody on the phone, and write it down, and like condense it. You need to be very curious. You need to be skeptical. Uh, you need to be have a little bit of being unafraid of talking to people and confronting people. I'm certainly confronting them. I never confront anybody. Some journalists do. I'm not a con confrontational person at all. But you need to have, uh, you know, a. a, a a radar for nonsense. You need to be able to um, sniff those things out. Uh, you need to be able to take orders from your editor. Um, it's a bit like being on a football team. There's a boss who tells you what to do. Um, and the creativity, I guess, comes in uh, with how you choose to tell the story. And the creativity is actually really important. Now that I think about it, the creativity is very important now because we can't do things the old way in journalism because it's not working. You know, we talked about this newsprint. You need to be creative in how you tell stories. So stories being told on Instagram, stories being told through podcasts, through video, a variety of other methods, lists, um, video. That's where the creativity come, comes in. Deciding how people in five years are going to want stories delivered to them. Um, so. In that way, yes, journalism doesn't create one. So I take my answer back, yes. Change it to yes. <laughs> yes? Just piggybacking off of that idea, what do you think about the new ways in which people are getting their information delivered to them, such as in Facebook, when we have articles that are clearly tailored towards our personal interests and that are very biased, being directed towards us, and, and people accepting such limited forms of news reports? Right. So there's, uh, the question is about um, when you receive information that's kind of tailored towards you on, say, a social media platform and that limits the breadth of knowledge and stories you're getting. I, I think this is true. Other people dispute it. I personally think it's true. I think we do live in these little echo chambers where, um, I can't remember his name now, he wrote a book called Filter Bubble, but it's about how... Uh, online interaction essentially means that instead of getting more and more and more information, you get less and less and less and less. For reasons having to do with, for example, the algorithms of Facebook, so that they um, tailor things to, your, to, to what they think you like, so that you aren't exposed to new information. And I think it's super dangerous, actually, for two reasons. One, you don't necessarily get to understand why people have different opinions from you. You don't respect that they have different opinions. You don't uh, uh, engage in debate with them. And the other is that uh, uh, the danger of like, false information, of stories that come to you that you know your aunt sends you, that are with like weird memes, and you're like, that's not true at all. Why? Where did you even get that from? So I think uh, that is dangerous. And my answer to that would be to read widely and skeptically, beyond Twitter, beyond Facebook. Just there's so much information out there. Every government has websites, every university, every think tank, all their reports on it, all their stuff. Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. You can find information everywhere. Okay, way up at the back. Um, yeah, so London, when the pops let out, that's a very dangerous place. The question is, did I ever have to go into any dangerous places? And uh, I would joke, but actually London is one of the scarier places, believe it or not. I ask people, are, oh, the up, the top deck of the bus is on London when the pops let out is a very frightening place. No, my short answer is no. I'm, I'm, I've been in riots and things like that, but um, no, I've never been to... Afghanistan or Iraq or anything. That is not my bag. <laughs> yes? Uh, with the point you said earlier about local news slowly being heated out and how international news networks and how news corporations and social media corporations uh, I mean, like, is slowly evolving the way journalism is viewed, how would you say uh, journalism is going to affect society in the future with how it's changing? Well, it's a 
very good question, and I think it will depend on the platforms that it's delivered on and the ways in which the stories are being told will, uh, will form what kind of stories we have, right? So will there be an appetite, for example, for investigative reporting? Will somebody be willing to fund this? Jeff Bezos, the owner of Amazon, bought the Washington Post, hired a lot of people. You, know, you might think one thing about him as the owner of Amazon, and I get that, but as a newspaper owner, that's a great thing, because they've been able to do a lot of investigative reporting. Um, will there be, will that be available in other areas where a rich person does not own a newspaper? I don't know. I really hope so, because uh, it is the lifeblood of democracy that you know and I know what's going on behind the scenes. And somebody does the boring stories about taxes and zoning and corruption and all these things. Um, you know, I look at the Bridgegate trial in New Jersey right now, which is absolutely fascinating. Somebody, you know, dug, dug and dug and did lots of stories so that we would find out. And today, Governor Chris Christie's, I think, been um, there's been some. He's been subpoenaed or something. Anyway, there's such, I think there's an appetite for investigative stories well told. The question is how it is funded. To even things like um, some news sites are going to crowdfunding. Some investigative journalists are using crowdfunding as a way to uh, pay for their work. Others use charitable foundations and um, public money, government money. So those are all hopefully uh, viable models for the future. Yeah. Oh, okay. Can I get the last question? Yeah. Quick question. A two-part question. How many drafts did you write? And did you ever, like, give up at a certain point and then get back to it? Uh, both excellent questions. I wrote, I would say, uh, I would say I wrote four or five major drafts and then many smaller drafts after that. And that's not much. I mean, there are novelists who go through like 25 drafts of a novel. It's, you would not believe how many kind of times. And did I, yes. And there are many times when I thought this is just utter crud. And nobody will ever want to read it. And I think Zoe Whittle, the novelist who's on now, I'll just tell you this quick story, who's on the Gilder Short uh, list this year um, for her novel, of Best Kind of People. She was just here. And I love the story that she's been telling about that novel. Because it's on the Giller shortlist, it's on the bestseller list, and it took her so long to write, and she kept thinking that it was terrible, and her agent and her editor kept saying, it's not, it's not working. And she said she wanted to throw it away, she wanted to bury it, but she kept going back to it, and she finally got it right. And, it, and it's a lot of work, but in the end, she, you know, you can, you can have something useful.